Tere! Ja meil on teid Tallinnas näha ja mõned korraldusikud teated. Meil on kohe algamas esimene paneel, kas hüldised inimõigused on üldse võimalikud erinevates kultuurides. Ja kuna me oleme erinevad, räägime erinevad keelt, siis me ütlen kohe, meil on tõlke võimalus. Iga üks võib rääkida selles keeles, mida ta kõige paremaks peab. Tõsi küll, tõlge on eesti ja inglise keeles. Nii et number ühe ajal te leiate oma aparatis eesti keelse kanali ja number kahe ajal siis inglise keelse. Ja selle kohta on ka info viidat seinte peal. Ja mul ongi hea meel nüüd kutsuda esimene paneel, kas siis universaalse inimõiguste võimalikud eri kultuurides selle vestusjuhi ajakirjaniku ja lähisida asjatundja Ille Ansa siia. Palun! Ma vabandan, et ma olen osada poole täis selja, aga nii et paluksin siia Ruube Maisseli. See on mulle suureks auks, et ma võin alustada esimese paneeliga ja ma tõepoolest hindan, et te olete kõik siia tulnud. Meil on siin publiik ja paneeli liikmed ja korraldajad. Ja ma tänan teid selle eest, et te selle ürituse korraldasite. Ja ma arvan, et meie esimene sessioon on kindlasti väga põnev, sellepärast, et see näitab publikule seda, kui vastuoluline on see piirkond, mida ma väga armastan ja kus ma olen nüüd töötanud viimase 7 või 8 aasta jooksul. Meil on suurepärased külalised tõelised, lähis idast ja ma tutustan neid lühidalt. Ning lisaks meil on ka huvitavad ja paneeli liikmeid ja me oleme siin kõik selleks, et tekida ta teis huvi. Ma pean ka selgitama, miks meil on päinud üks paneeli liige, kes on laval, sest poliitilise ping, et ta on probleemiks ja kahjuks on ka põhjus Miks teatud riikide kodanikud ei saa meiega praegusel hetkel lava jagada ja ei saa kõik kohale tulla ja lähes idast. Kui ta eestlaste näeme, kõik usume sõnavabadusse, nii et me oleme selle tegevuse korraldanud sellisel viisil, et meil on kõibelt esimene paneeli liige ja siis hiljem teise paneeli liikme tühinevad meiega. Ja kommentaarine tahaksin öelda, et mina ise usun seda, et universaalne aspekt inimõigustes on saavutatav. Ma tahan selle nimel töötada ja ma töötangi selle nimel. Olen ajakirjanik ja koolitan inimese inimõiguste valdkonnas nendes riikides, kus inimõigused ei ole isenes mõistetavad. Sest kes on valmis kannatama, öelge mõni kultuur, kus inimest on valmis kannatama. Kes tahab, et tema omand võetakse ära või kes tahab, et tema õigused võetakse temalt ära. Vajadus inimest inimõigust järgi ei ole seotud ühegi kultuuriga, see ei ole seotud mingi geograafilise asukohaga. Ja inimõigust olemasule ei muuda kõik inimesi ühesugusteks. Ma aegalt olen seda kuulnud, et sellest räägitakse. Minu ajaks on see hoopis vastupidine, sest inimõigused võimaldavad kõikidel väljanda oma identiteeti ja teha seda uhkelt ja ilma tagakehusamise hirmuta. Samas ma olen realist ja ma näen, et sellel protsessil ei ole lõputähta aega. See muudatus on väga aeglane, sest me on tegemist ühiskondadega ja selleks, et inimõigusi ellu viia, siis see tähendab ka seda, et me või anname demokraatiale võimaluse, me harime inimesi, me võitleme korruptsiooniga. Ning see tähendab ka seda, et me sunnime riike aegalt ise endaga tõtvaatama. 
sest me ei tohiks unusta seda, et inimeeg õigus kõigepealt rakendati selleks, et kaitsta kodanike riigi eest. Need olla sahakirjanik ja humanitaar töötaja, siis see ei ole kõige turvalisem elukutse, vähemalt mitte selles piirkonnes, kus mina töötan. Ja ma võin ka teile öelda, et meil on vaja nende inimeste abi, kes ei saa muudatustes kasu, sest nemad võivad oma võimus edutu kaotada. Nii et minu jaoks see küsimus, kas inimõigus võivad olla universaalsedaks õigusteks või kas on mõningad, et see kultuurides ei sobi, siis ma ei usu, et see küsimus oleks väga hästi koostatud. Ja ma tahan elada turvalist elu ja ma tahan olla edukas ja selline soov on universaalne. Inimõigused on saavutatavad ja üks asi, mis on kultuuriliselt suhtelne on see, kuidas selle tulemuseni jõudas ja kuidas on oluline. Nii et kui me tahame aidata, me peame mõistma inimese kultuuri ja identiteeti, mis on pidevalt muutumas, aga see on juba hoopis teissugune teema. Aga see on ka põhjus, miks me oleme täna siia tulnud. Ja nüüd ma tahaksin oma paneeli liiget tutvustada. Ja paneeli liikmed väljandavad oma arvamusi. Seejärel me alustame aruteluga. Ja ma loodan, et publik väljandab oma poolseid arvamusi ja kommenteerivad ka. Ja ma olen väga range ajast kinni pidamisega, sest meil on ainult poolteist tundi selleks, et maailma kõige suuremad probleemid ära lahendada. Nii et meie paneeli liikmed täna, kõigepealt professor Petra Selge, kes istub seal Tallinna ülikooli professor, ta mõõpetab poliitteooriat. Ja tema pealised huvid on seotud võimuteooriga, poliitilise semioodikaga. Ja need on väga asjakohased praegu ja ta vaatab ka sootsiaalteaduste valdkonda, nimelt tema on meie teine sõnavõtja ja tema keeraldab meile siis seda filosoofilist ja teoreetilist alust andu teemale. Iragast on Ašur Sargones Karja, kes esindab väga vana Iraagi etnilist vähemust, kes on süürlased. Ja nemad on tema on Asüüra abiorganisatsiooni Kristlast abistama ühingu liige ja toetab Põhja-Eraagi arengud ning ta on minu hea sõber. Mul on väga hea meel, et sa oled Eestis, mul on hea meel, et sa siia ka jõudsid. Robert Ilatov, he's a former Israeli Knesset. Ja tasi Robert Ilatov, kes on... Endine Knesseti liige, ta sündis Spekistanis ja ta on olnud ka peaministri Benjamin Netanyahu nõunik ja ta on konsulteerinud teda venekeelse juudi kogukonna osas, nii et tema inglise keelt ei räägi ja võtke oma kõrva klapid, kui ta just ei räägi heebra keelt. Edasi, see oled Chaplin, ühineb meie ka Venemalt, Skype abil ja kahjuks ta ei saa Eestisse reisida. Ja ta on Venaõiguse vaimulik ülempreister, kes tegi tööd ühendades kirikut ja ühiskonda tagaots oma töökoha sellepärast, et ta ütles, et Venema sisab selmitsi katastroofiga, kui võimud ei luba arutelusid ja avalike õluprotsesse. Nii et ülempreester on autor ja aktivist, nii et tere. I hope he can hear us. Tõttavasti kuulem meid ka. I'm sure he can hear us. But last but not least. Ning nagu lubandud, me jätkame siis laval ja doktor Ruba Mais on kõigepealt, kes on Süüre Libanoni päritolu. Ta on ekonomist ja ta on spetsialist arengu küsimustes ja rõnda küsimustes. 
Ta on maanduste ta on aktivist, ta nõuab poliitilis muutust Libanonis. Ta on ka minu hea kolleeg ja minu kangelane. Ja nais kangelana võib öelda. Ta on teinud väga palju tööd Liibanoni selleks, et leevenda rändekriisi ja põgulaskriisi ning ta toetab nende inimeste õigusi, kes, kes on sõjadõttu põgenenud. Ruba, kindly open the panel. Ruba, palun. Sina oled siis esimene paneeli kõneleja. Hear me. Tere hommikust. Suur tänu mind siin võõrustamas. See on mulle suur auk. Tege ette 1992 või 1995 võõrustaksime inimõiguste konverentsi ja kutsume kommunistiku partei nõuniku või, et konverents korradatakse täna ja kutsume põhja Korea presidendi nõuniku, kes räägi inimõigustest. Selline oli minu tunne, kui mind kutsuti käesolevasse paneeli et rääkida küll kõrv, küll ja kõrval Iisraeli peaministri nõunikuga riik, mis süsteemselt palestiinlasi alla surub, maa surub, mis institutsionaalselt diskrimineerib, mitte ainult araablasi rahvahulgas, aga ka must rahvus vähemust ja sisserändajaid ja naisi ja kus on probleeme pagulaste õigustega ja vabaduste piiramisega küsimust. Nii et siin me räägime eetilises soovimatusest samal laval viibida säärast inimestega ja lavalt sooviks siin Homer Shekir oma sõbrale Human Rights Watchi ähm, liikmele Tervitused saata. Tema saadeti Iisraelist välja lihtsalt sellepärast, et ta Iisraeli valitsust kritiseeris. Tahaksin Vaatele Hansenit siteerida, kas eile ütles, et inimärikuse osa on reaalsusega silmitsi seismine, nii et ma arvame, peame seisma silmitsi reaalsusega, et inimõigused ning inimõiguste kuritarvitamine ei saa kõrvuti eksisteerida. Aga igal juhul suur tänu kutse eest ja et saanud laval üksinda. Mul on kolm mõtteavaldust esiteks, kas inimõigused on universaalsed, teiseks kelle inimõigused, inimõiguste paradigma silmakirjalik rakendamine ja kuidas saavutada inimõigusi kolmeks. Ma olen moslem, minu perekonnas isa oli feminist, kes võimestas mind läbi hariduse ja moslemine ma usun, kristluse, judaismi ja islami pädevusse, ehk siis religioonid, mis ootavad inimõigusi. Minu veendumus on, et inimesed on meie vennad ja õed usus või inimlikuses meie kaaslased ja 7. sajandil pea 1300 aastat enne inimõiguste deklaratsiooni islam keelustas orjuse naiste noorte tõrgute matmise ja inimõiguste rikkumise. Kahjuks paljud inimesed küsivad, et miks me siis paljudes moslemi usulistes riikides täna ei näe. Mina usun, et politiseerimine ja ideoloogia instrumentaliseerimine on see põhjus, miks me seda ei näe. Paljud radikaalsed ideoloogiad on esile kerkinud ja usu tõlgendus tekitab selle näilise konflikti selle vahel, mida nimet, nemad nimetavad islamiks ja inimõiguste vahel. Aga seda me näeme kõikide usundite pool ka radikaalsed kristlased, kes ei usu LGBT, feminismi ja inimõiguste põhimõtetes see rakendub ka sionismile, mis on judaismi lahk, mis põhineb rassismil, et teatud inimestele antakse õigused riikluses osale teistel mitte ja see rakendub loomulikult ka äärmuslikule islami ideoloogiale ja inimesed, kes kasutavad islamit relvana, keda me isegi moslamiteks ei pea. Näiteks tooksin siin kohal Näiteks Iisise, paljud Iisise võitlejad on radikaliseerunud läänes 
ISIS ei võitle ainult asüürlaste ja kristlaste vastu. Kõige rohkem kannatavad araablased ja moslemid isise tõttu, näiteks Süürias, kui kogukondadel on võimalus, siis nad ütlevad, et isis meid ei esinda ja viskavad nad välja. Nii et miks 48. aastast alates palestiinlased ikka nõuad inuegusi, miks araablased Jemenis ja Iraagis käivad meelt avaldamas Ja teiseks siis silmakirjalikus inimõiguste suhtes, kus inimõiguse, kas ainult läänes, kas ainult lääne kodanikele või kõikjal mujal ka eile te räägisid, et vend on metsanduse entusiast paljudes riikides armastatakse loomi ja metsa inimõigusi, aga samas nende samade riikide piiril pagulised surevad, kas lääne väärtused ja inimõigused ei saa siis koos eksisteerida. Ma tegin pakalauruse kraadi prantsuse keeles ja õppisin suurepärast väärtuste kohta, aga Süüria sõja ajal ma nägin, et inimõigusi ei kohaldata ühtmoodi peamiselt läne riikides, mitte kõikides riikides ühtmoodi. Ehk siis kus ja kuidas inimõigusi rakendatakse, kas teatud riikide laste elud on väärduslikumad kui teiste riikide laste elud. Selles suhtes me ei saa öelda, et inimesed on suhtelised. Inimesed lihtsalt kasutavad ja rakendavad inimõigusi erinevalt erinevates piirkondades. Ja viimane punkt puudutab seda, kuidas saavutada inimõigusi. Muudatus võtab väga palju aastaid aega ja Mina igapäev ärkan maailma väga keerulises piirkonnas ja otsustan, et ma töötan inimõiguste nimel. Meil on suurepärane partnerud pagulasabiga, kus me koolitame noori naisi ja mehi, et parandada nende tööhõivet. Ma usun haridus, kui islami teoloogia tekitab inimõiguste kõik rikkumisi, siis üks viis, kuidas me saame inimesi ära eemale hoida radikaalsetest liikumistest, nagu Iisis on see, et neil on võimalus teenida elatis, et nad on haritud, nii et ma usun, et väga oluline on austada kohalike, teha alt üles tööd ja mõist mine, et muutus võtab aega ja ka Euroopa kodanikud peavad mõisma, et demokraatia on väga oluline töövahend. Me oleme võidelnud, me oleme kaotanud Süürias pool millaid inimest, et demokraatia on nimel, aga teil siin lähenes on see olemas. Nii et võib olla selleks, et tagada üldised inimõigused, tähendab seda, et ei tohi inimõigusi ja demokraatiat võtta isenedes mõistetavana. Tuleb mõelda, kuhu teie riik seku, kuhu mitte ja julgele, kui nõukogu mitalise liikmena on Eestil ka poliitilistes otsustes üle maailma sõna õigus, et lõpetada vägivald ja kannatused ja sõjad maailmas ja tagada kestlik rahu, mis põhineb õiglusel. Kui mingit ülemenekud õiglusel ei ole, siis ei tule ka rahu. Ma olen 31 aastane. Ma olen sama vana kui Leping, mis Libanoni kodusõja lõpetas, aga 31 aasta mõõtlusel Mõõdudes me näeme, et inimesed on jälle tänaval meelt avaldamas sellepärast, et kurikaelad on endiselt võimul. Nii et oluline on poliitiline süsteem, mitte niivõrd inimesed erinevates riikides ja iga inimene, nagu ütles justiitsminister, tahab elada võrdsuse, väärikuse, põhimõtete alusel. Iga inimene osub inimõigustesse tegelikult südames. Mul sai aeg otsa aida. Thank you very much. You are very precise. Suur tänu, sa pidasid väga täpselt aes kinni ja me kindlasti palume sul uuesti sõna võtta arutelude käigus ja nüüd ma paluksin siis teistel paneeli liikmetel kaandulle lavale. Tere tulemast teile, Peeter Selg. Nii, mikrofon töötab ka. Mul on väga hea meel ja see on mulle suureks auks, et ma saan siin olla. Suur tänu, et mind kutsusite. 
see on selles põttes paradoks, et mina peaks olema see, kes annab teoreetilise tausta, sest mina õpin poliitilist teoorija, ta õpetan seda ja räägin võimust ja samal ajal Ma ei tahaks minna liiga filosoofiliseks ja ma ei taha nüüd räägida inimõiguste filosoofilisest taustast, vaid ma räägiks ja rohkem poliitilisest taustast. Nii et see, mida me paneelis kuuleme, on väga tehedalt seotud poliitiliste jõupingutustega, mis praegu sel hetkel maailmas veel toimuvad, kui me räägime inimõiguste küsimusest. Kõigepealt ma tahaksin alustada sellest teemast, mis on seotud inimõiguste suhtelisusega ja universaalsusega. Sest ma leian, et kui me räägime universaalsusest inimõiguste valdkonnas, siis see on suhteline universaalsus. See on universaalsus millegi suhtes inimõiguste. Ja see miski on pidevalt muutumas ja arenemas. Tegemist on fenomenega, mida me saame nimetada inimväärikuseks, mis vajab kaitsmist. Tegemist on pidevalt muutuva keskkonnaga. Rääkides inimväärikusest siis see idee isenesest on väga vana. Me teame, et on tegemist inimu olendiku sellisega seotud väärikusega, aga see idee on küllaltki värske, kui me vaatame antiikaastud, siis tegemist on aru samaga, et keegi väärib meie austust. Varem oli see alati seotud teatud hierarhiliste positsioonidega. Sa pidid selle austuse ära teenima ja sa pidid saavutama teatud privilegi, teatud staatuse. Kuid see aru saam, et inimesel kui sellisel on iseneses mõistetalt oma väärikus ja ei ole asja, mida sa võiksid ära teenima, vaid inimväärikus on seotud sellega, et sa oled inimolend siis see idee on ainult paar sta aastat vana teoreetilistes aruteludes. Saksa filosofi Manuel Kant oli esimene, kes kasutas just sellist sõnastust. Kuid kui me räägime praktilisest ja poliitilisest ühiskonnatasandist, see on veelki pärskem aru saam. Et see on asi, mida tihti peale võetakse isenes mõistetavana. Et inimolendiga käib kaasas ka inimväärikus. Tegemist on ideega, mis pidevalt on muutumas. Ja see on küllaltki ebamääran laiali valgu või samas sellega kaasnad ka teadud eelised. Nii et need jõuvingutsed inimõiguste nimel hoolimata sellest, millist inimõiguste deklaratsiooni kasutatakse, selle deklaratsiooni sisu muutub ajas. Tihti peale öeldakse seda, et inimõigusel on erinevad rakendustasandid, meil on abstraktne, konseptsuaalne tasand. Ja me eeldame, et siin on tegemist universaalse lähendamisega. See on suhteline, kui meil on tegemist juba kohaliku tasandiga ja konkreetsema kontekstiga. Siin me vaatame juba rakendustasandidid ja mida me peaksime poliitikas muutma või tegema selleks, et enimõigusi kaitsta. Nüüd kui me räägime teisest olulisest punktist, kus me kirjeldame seda, kas inimõigused on midagi, mis on lääneriikidele 
omane võis tegemist on siis kolonialismi pärandiga, kuidas me maailma näeme. Ma ütleks, et lääneriikide kultuuril on olnud väga vähe neid asju, mis toetakse automaalselt universaalselt unimõigusi, sest kultuur on tuginud hierarhiatel aasta tuhandeid ja seda on peetud asjade loomulikus käiguks. Ning kui me räägime arutelus läänekultuuris, ma tahaksin viidata veel ühele ideele, mis on kindlasti seotud inimõiguste ideega ja see on aru saam, et poliitika peaks olema oma iselomult demokraatlik, nii et poliitilise jõubinguduse tuumaks peaks olema siis ebavõrdsuste kaotamine. Siin alustasime kõigepealt naiste hääleõigusest, siis me kõigepealt oli hääleõigus kõigepealt, Ainult valgetel meestel, kellel oli mingi omand või maa või vara ja siis liikusime edasi universaalse hääleõiguse poole erinevates ühiskondas, erinevatel hetkedel. Ja et see idee, et meil on nüüd alus, mille põhjal me saame nõuda võrdsed kohtlemist, siis on uus asi, mis on seotud demokraatia, demokraatliku revolutsiooniga. Ning see ongi inimõiguste idee aluseks. Ja ma ütleks, et viimaste põlgonda või viimaste aasta kümnedade jooksul alles me saame rääkida, et lääne maailmas ja mitte nüüd päris igal pool maailmas on see idee muutunud isenesest mõistetavaks. Kui me räägime võitlusest ebavõrdsusega ja räägime inimõiguste või ka muude õiguste saavutamise võitlust, siis see kõik jätkub ja mis, et see kunagi ei lõppe, sellepärast, et küsimuseks ongi see, et igakord, kui mingi asi nüüd päevakorras maha võetakse, et mõned asjad on isenes mõistetavad ja siis, kui mingi asja on saavutatud, siis tekib mingi uus teema. Ja me ei saa siin välistada teantud poliitilist reaalsust, mis esile kergib. Kõik need valdkonnad arenevad, nad kumuleeruvad ja ma ei näe, et inimõiguste võitlus kunagi kaoks. Suur täna! Ja palu nüüd ära, Rassur! Su täna, et mind kutsusite siia. Pärast universaalse inimõsõõguste deklaratsiooni vastuvõtmist 1948. aastal, siis see on muutunud aluseks, mille põhjal arendatakse inimõigusi erinevates maailma piirkondades ja tuginades nendele põhimõtetele, siis me võiksime öelda, et kõik süsteemi peaks tulema sarnas, et nii lääneriikudes kui ka mujal. Aga nagu te teate, Erinevates kultuurides on erinevad traditsioonid ja enamustel, vähemustel on tihti peale erinevad õigused kahjuks. Asüürlased Iraagis on väga heaks näiteks selle kohta, kuidas inimõigusi on kuritarud viimase saja aasta jooksul. Tegemist on erineva etnilise tausta ja usulise taustaga inimestega võrreldase enamusega. Ja see on olnud probleemiks ja annud põhjuse araablastele, kurdidele ja türklastele neid tappa ja võtta üle neende teritoriumeid. See ei olnud seotud ainult asüüra kristlaste või armeenlastega. Otomani ajal oli see sama probleemi siididel, kes, keda suruti alla moslemide poolt suruti maha inimeste õigusi riigi poolt ja seda ka juba põhiseaduse abil. See traditsioon jätkus ja me näeme, et igas valdkonnas on meil negatiivsed mõju kogukonnale ja üksikisikutele. 
Esimesed sarnased olukorrad, kus me näeme, et need õigustes kinni ei peetud ja kinni ei peetud ka inimõiguse põhimõtetest oli see, kui me vaatame Iraagi konstitutsiooni päevusel hetkel, mis ei saa vastu põhiõigustele, sest põhiseadusartiklis 2 on öeldud, et usk on islam ja Ühski seadus ei saa olla islami põhimõttedega vastuolus, nii et kõik Iraagi seadused on põhimõttelised järgmise šaria seadusi. Ehk siis kõik asjad, mis on vastu islami põhimõttedele, on seadusest väljas poole jäävad. Ka need, mis puudutavad mitte muslamid, ka saada süüra kristlased, jisiidise, juudid, mandais, bahaid, kalkaid ja puudutab ka teisi usuulise vähemalusi. Siviilõigus, mis puudutab kõiki kodanike, siis seal eelistatakse samamoodi moslemeid ja on võimalik võtta vastu islamiusk, aga islamiusul see ei ole võimalik vastu minna teisele usule üle ja seega ei saa lapsed usku vahatada ja inimestel ei olegi võimalus püürda mõne teise usu poole. Nüüd õigus uskuda või mitte uskuda ei ole kaitstud. Nii et kui meil on tegemist islamiusku inimesega, siis ta ei saa usku vahetada. Siis kui sa usku vahetad, siis sa kaotad oma õigused ühiskonnas naiste õigusi. Samuti kuri taritakse sellepärast, et Iraagi seadus on usupõhine. Nii et kohtu silmis on kahe naise tunnistus võrne ühe mehe tunnistusega, nii et naise sõna on väärt ainult pool mehe sõnast. Ja meie ei ole leinud valitsuse poolset tunnustamist ja Iraagi valitsus on rikkunud asüürla kristlaste õigusi ja neid on peetud uskumatuteks ja neid on röövitud, nais ja vägistatud ja seda ja meie õigusi pole praeguses konstitutsioonis isegi mainitud. Kui teise poolt, kui me vaatame ühiskonda ja ühiskonna traditsiooni, siis Me ei oleme usulne vähemus lääne ühiskonna mõttes, aga meil ei ole ühtegi süsteemi, mis kirjeldaks Iraagi ühiskonna erinevaid liikmeid ja seda ei võeta arvesse ka haridussüsteemis. Siin räägitakse ainult islami ajaloost, nagu Iraagi ajalogu oleks saanud algus ainult araablaste sisserändega. 68. aastal otsustati ajalogu ümber keerutada. Eesmärgis oli toetada araabia keelsed koolisüsteemi, araabia keelsed meediat. Ehk siis, kui meil on tegemist ta süürlasega, siis võidakse meid vahistada rahvusluse tõttu. Ning see kõik jätkus ka 90. aastatel pärast kui veidi siis rünnakud ja asa ei algu sellest aeg ka usu kampaania, kus eesmärgis oli õpetada islamid ja koraani pandi kinni kõik kohad, kus müüdi alkoholi näiteks oli ühe selle seaduse tulemus. Iraagis orjapidamist ei olnud, aga nagu te teate, mida tegi isis aastal 2014, kus oli väga palju kristlastes ja isidis naisi, kes võeti orjadaks ja Iraagi valitsus siiamaani ei ole suutnud neid naisi veel vabastada, kelle on ära röövinud isis. Nii et teadlikus inimõigusest Iraagis siis me peaksime ütlema, et meil ei ole piisavalt informatsiooni selle kohta, seda ei õpetata. Nii et Iraagis on meil probleem sellega, et vähemustel ei lasta elada rahus. Teatud juhtudel me oleme näinud seda, et inim õigusi kasutatakse kellegi vastu.
Me oleme näinud valitsuse kuritarvitamist ja Sadamme režiime ajal tuhandete Iraklasi tapeti ja saadeti kodust välja ning viidi läbi demograafilise muudatused piiri aladel ja seal saadeti asüürlased oma ajaloolises piirkondest välja. Tegemist oli süsteemise vägivallaga rahvusgruppide vastu, mille teostaks olid Sadami režiim, siis samas väga paljud riigid toetasid tema tegevust, võimaldasid seda ja need ei olnud kuriteot, millest seda oleks süüdistatud selle asemel võetada vastutustele teiste kuritegude eest aastal 2003 kaasa arvatud ka rahvusvalis keelustatud relvade omamine. Praegusel hetkel ei ole Kõik selle veel ühel meelel, kas see oli tegelikult nii, nii et samas inimõiguste rikkumisi ignoreeritakse vastavalt siis erinevate riikide huvidele ja nendele teematele, mis seal praegu selle hetkel on suur tänu. Mr. Robert Ilatov, please. Bokev to, good morning. Nii võtse võtsid vaväelid ja hea. Good morning, everyone. The first of all. I would like to comment on what uh, Mrs. Ruba said about Israel. The state of Israel is the only democratic country in the Middle East. The only country based on rule of law, the only country that upholds human rights and defends and protects human rights. 20% of Israel population is minorities whose uh, rights Israel protects. So now I gain some time. Thank you. So briefly to repeat, the state of Israel is the only country in the Middle East which is a free, democratic, where all human rights are guaranteed to all citizens, also all minorities, Arabs. There is uh, freedom of religion for all religions. Judaism, Christianity and Islam in Israel. It's the only country where the number of representatives of the three religions has increased, not decreased, as in other countries in our region. In Israel, there is no religious nor national uh, persecution. We have uh, 13 Arab Knesset members and also other minorities represented in Knesset. So everybody has full political rights. As to settlements, in Samaria and Judas, then it is ridiculous that Israel is persecuted and accused that Jews can occupy Judah areas. How can this line of thinking even apply? The there is a mandate guaranteed that on Palestine mandate area there will be um, settlements. And there were victims on both sides. That's very painful. But to state that the state that uh, Israel occupies Judah territories and Jews are occupants in Judah or Samaria is absurd because no country was on Samaria and Judah territories when Israel um, took these territories from Jordan. No other Arab states were represented there. Our Jews are told to establish another state on the territory of historical Samaria and Judah. We are willing to negotiate with the other nation, but unfortunately in Palestine, the preconditions uh, are applied to all negotiations and uh, this dispute will not end before we have direct negotiations. But as Ruba decided to attack Israel in the question and issue of human rights, but at the same time was afraid to sit on stage with me because she knows that her 
rights will not be protected when she returns to her uh, home. So instead of looking at how Arab country citizens are treated, how human rights are trampled in Arab countries, Israel is accused instead. And this is done aggressively. Israel is an island, the only democratic country, the only country that actually protects citizens their freedom of religion and economic freedoms, freedom of speech. How to look at whether a country is democratic or not? Is it based on rule of law or not? Do people have the right to vote, participate in elections, independent judiciary, rule of law? In our region, is there anything like that, uh, like freedom of media? Is there anything like this in the Middle East, outside Israel? No, they are afraid to even uh, sit in discussion with us because they are afraid of freedom of speech. So Israel is the only one who is actually protecting human rights. But they have the right to, to commit terrorism, uh, to send rockets at our citizens, but we need to sit and defend ourselves by saying that we defend human rights. Something else that's important to mention. The um, European countries um, were forced to mark uh, Samaria manufactured products, not as products uh, manufactured in Israel. C well, can you imagine uh, the uh, independence uh, attempts in Catalonia? Can you imagine uh, that uh, Catalonia production would be marked separately, uh, that it's not Spanish production? Can somebody accuse a Spaniard and tell them they cannot uh, have real estate in Catalonia. Arabs cannot sell their property to Jews. Do you know that? Isn't that apartheid? Who stands for the rights of Jews? Or moreover, who sells land or property to Jews? Uh, they. Um, this is their death sentence. Where are the rights of the Arabs who want to execute their economic rights? Uh, why do they get a death sentence for selling their property to Jews? Why can't you Jews uh, purchase uh, assets in Saudi Arabia? It's prohibited by law. So saying that the state of Israel is trampling on people's rights is completely wrong. We have an independent judiciary justice system, we operate according to international law. When there are breaches of human rights, then our Supreme Court takes decisions uh, also against the Israel government and military when we need to defend human rights. It's the state of Israel that is protecting human rights. And moreover, I would like to state that the security of Muslims and Jews and Christians is best protected in Israel out of Middle Eastern countries because security is the biggest shortcoming in the Middle East. Uh, Kurds, uh, Shias, Sinai, their rights are trampled on. And uh, the uh, UN uh, Security Council has become a political organization. I understand I'm out of time, but I would like to say that the State of Israel is the only one that protects human rights in the Middle East in the harshest conditions surrounding us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your opinion. <laughs> and I am hoping uh, Father Sevolod is now with us. Good morning. Good morning, welcome. Do you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, I'm hearing you. It's a great pleasure to uh, greet you and to uh, underline that the organizers of the conference are very effective in uh, collecting people from different contexts, from different traditions. And I think it's very important to uh, really look another time at the uh, international human rights mechanisms and the uh, international architecture of human rights from different traditions, from different philosophies and uh, even from different law systems. I think we must always have a courage to question and even reconsider any system, any uh, philosophy, any idea about the world, including the international philosophy of human rights and even the foundations of international and national law. Uh, in the former Soviet Union, some people had the courage to question the system. And even in the contemporary Russia, I think it's important to question the system. Uh, that's what we do during rallies, during public discussions, uh, often with a lot of criticisms, open and hidden criticisms from different circles, from different people. But I think uh, having the courage to question the system is what is deeply needed in the uh, national and international contexts. Uh, including the context of thinking about human rights. Uh, we all know the idea of the conflict of civilizations, which uh, was and still is widely spread among philosophers, among, among political scientists, among uh, different international circles. I think we need to avoid the conflict of civilizations, but to avoid it, it's important to understand that different civilizations may be based on quite different traditions which define not only ethnic cultures, cuisines, etc., but different legal systems. For some of the, of the civilizations, including the Islamic and the Orthodox Christian civilizations, uh, true and supreme law is not invented by human beings but is given by the un unchangeable God. And because it's given by the unchangeable God, uh, this true law, this supreme law, is unchangeable itself. Uh, in uh, the concept of Sharia, in the concept of the God-given law, uh, in the context of the Orthodox Christian civilization, and as well in uh, some elements of the Roman Catholic civilization, it's important to underline that religion defines not only what's happening in churches or mosques or synagogues, it defines uh, many elements of politics and statehood, it defines uh, many elements of economy and of course also culture, uh, spread of information, etc. So I think uh, the West should finally take into account that different civilizations and different systems, different legal understandings of the society and the state exist in the contemporary world. And the question of human rights uh, is right in the center of the argument. Uh, there are, of course, things which are more important than human rights in many traditions. The basic rights may be similar in different cultures, but the list of their priorities may differ in different civilizations to a level of a serious contradiction. For example, uh, we know, of course, the big argument uh, among the adherents of the territorial integrity of a country and the right for self determination. We know about this contradiction uh, from the conflict in the Balkans, we know about it in uh, the present situation in and around Ukraine, and the rights for self-determination uh, and the uh, principle of territorial integrity often get into contradiction with each other. But we see very clearly that uh, very often both people who are in favor of uh, self-determination and those who are in favor of the territorial integrity of the state see these values as something more important than right to life. In many contexts, collective rights 
even uh, defined by the so-called positive law, are more important than individual rights. Some people would say, who decided uh, that collective rights are less important than individual ones? Ecological issues and many other contemporary debates are not making such a contradiction less complicated. Uh, it's quite seen that the universal right to a healthy environment is increasingly seen, even in the West, as something more important than economic freedoms or uh, overall freedoms of an individual. We see the increasing debate about whether economic uh, freedoms should be sacrificed to the overall collective or universal right to a healthy ecology. And uh, in this context, the very uh, uh, disbalance between individual and collective rights is being questioned. People say uh, ecology is above the individual freedom in economy. I think the time is coming for reconsidering the balance between uh, individual and collective rights and among civil, political, economic and cultural rights, even if this reconsideration would require uh, the questioning and probably altering of the basic international legal instruments. It's important to include different civilizations in this process of reconsideration without the dominance uh, of the modern or postmodern West. That's what I wanted to state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us from Moscow. All the best. Unfortunately, uh, Father Chaplin will not be able to stay with us for the Q&A part, uh, but I will, uh, we, we will expect uh, your comments if you want to uh, comment on uh, his thoughts, uh, you are most welcome to. Uh, so let us continue with uh, what is called the guided talk. <laughs> that means that I'll start with questions and uh, if you wanna comment or uh, add your questions, just raise your hands and we will have people in this uh, hall. Uh, they will come to you uh, with a microphone. And uh, do try to formulate your questions as questions rather than statements because we will have a coffee break later and we can all exchange our views and, and uh, uh, any ideas uh, in a more informal setting. So, as uh, promised, uh, I think the topic, uh, as you see, is uh, highly controversial and uh, there are really very many different views when it comes to uh, different countries and uh, different uh, social groups, even. Um, so, <clears throat> Professor Peter Zelg, I would uh, start uh, with you. I mean, you essentially said that human rights are like an everlasting struggle and I, uh, for dem democracy and innately it's uh, political work. And uh, I really do agree with you here. Uh, now, as a practitioner, uh, I would like to ask you if you could define some uh, preconditions uh, in a society that is willing to secure uh, at least the very basic of human rights and, uh, and uh, think um, how to forward uh, or uh, further the social rights. What are the preconditions? Uh, okay. Uh, maybe one uh, route here would be sort of popularize an idea that I have been actually writing about in my um, more academically or even less academically oriented <coughs> publications. Uh, this is an idea which I would call the ethos of contingency. It sounds peculiar, but the idea is basically this, that in order to have a society in which uh, truths like uh, human liberties, human rights are taken, taken as self-evident, there should be a general understanding in the societal level uh, that all the social positions in the society are not natural uh, uh, 
God-given, but they are contingent and constantly changing and could be reversed. Uh, underlying this idea is actually the idea of reciprocity. Uh, if you want to think about how should we conduct uh, our daily issues or how, which kind of rules we would adopt, then we should think in terms of reciprocity, which means that would we agree with this kind of arrangement if we didn't actually know which position we would end up with. Actually, the famous figure of whale of ignorance uh, referred to uh, our justice, uh, Council of Justice uh, developed by John Rawls is actually uh, the same idea, but in a more technical manner. So that's underlying this idea is uh, what I have been referred to, that there should be an ethos among the members of society that no position as such is permanent and natural. And most of the history, of course, this is a very uh, awkward view of the world, and actually democracy and human rights are very awkward things. They are not natural in the sense they are very recent inventions, understanding that the society is dynamic and constantly changing. So how do you possibly implement it? Actually, to say it first, less provocatively, I would appeal to the old notion of education here again. Actually, it comes down to the ancient times. The great philosophers of the ancient period, Plato, Aristotle and others who were against democracy, weren't against democracy as such, but they were against democracy given the situation they were in, in which most of the, uh, let's call it people, or demos, weren't able to educate for themselves because according to them, uh, the police or the state was meant to be uh, governed according to the virtue and virtue needs education, virtue needs actually free time to educate yourself. Actually the word school, schule, comes from the word schule which means uh, the um, uh, free time that you can dedicate to yourself and to uh, educating yourself. To put it in a more, uh, more provocative terms, uh, besides education, I would appeal to a certain notion of power. Actually, the issue here is about normalization. Normalization of the view that no position in society is God-given, natural, uh, unchangeable, permanent. No sh uh, uh, normalization of the idea that positions are contingent. And normalization as it is often argued in contemporary political theory, is a very important instrument of power. It works not only through education, it works through different forms of surveillance system which make us normal people. And how to implement it, actually, it's a matter of political, practical choices for which I don't have very good recipes here. So. Thank you, and it uh, seems that it also takes a lot of trust yeah. to trust the other, mm -hmm. as we define. Uh, Ashur, I would uh, uh, come back to the grievances of the Assyrian community in, uh, <coughs> in Iraq, and uh, I mean in Turkey and in other in Middle Syria, East, yeah. in, in Syria as well, yes. Uh, so, I mean, to sum up, what you mentioned, I see that the radical Arab or Kurdish or Turkish nationalism, uh, which exclude pretty much other uh, identities, uh, and to add to this political Islam uh, and the uh, huge mismanagement of the economy, and just generally a very poor state of law in Iraq uh, is causing a huge uh, part of your community to leave Iraq. Um, are there any voices in your community that could offer alternative 
ideologies uh, for the regional states and you mean, how you build the trust in the you community? You mean uh, our community, the Assyrian or the Iraqi? The Your the, community in Iraq. So the, you know that uh, since Iraq established uh, after uh, being uh, uh, Ottoman Empire was collapsed so that uh, build a, a new country but uh, the uh, let's say the suffer of uh, people who are living under the new state was continuous and uh, uh, never were uh, solved those uh, troubles. Uh, it was continual since 1933, the huge genocide, uh, thousands of Assyrians being killed in Semele, in huge massacres led by the government, and there was tribes from the Kurd uh, and the Arab uh, participating in this, unfortunately. There was other cases of people uh, from the Arab and from the Kurd tribes who protect the, and save uh, some Assyrian and uh, Christian. Uh, the same happened for Jews later in uh, 40, 41, 42, after the Assyrians, and uh, uh, now maybe few Jews living in Iraq. And this uh, scenario is continuous in the country, unfortunately, and uh, it's repeated so that the trust between the community is lost because uh, the survivor of the 1915-16 uh, genocide under the Ottoman, as a Syrian and uh, Armenian Greek, who uh, Syrian who uh, are in Iraq and Syria still were suffering, and this was repeated in 2014 again, and now it's uh, much should be done by the a government and by the society to uh, give a return trust to the people to return back to their regions and to, to their cities. And uh, unfortunately, until this moment, all what we heard is only promises from everyone, but nothing is uh, uh, helping. F less than 50% of people now, they've been able to return back to uh, some uh, regions and places in Nineveh Plain and other places still uh, people don't trust to return back, like example Mosul city, it was a city where uh, uh, Syrian, Christian, uh, Jews and the Muslim lived uh, there thousands of years ago and uh, in 2014 there was less than 2,000 uh, families left and they uh, uh, left because the ISIS told them you should convert, pay tax or leave. This system of dummies is uh, working on the society. Yes, the government said it's not uh, exist, but uh, in reality, uh, people have different experience. And uh, uh, now, less than 50 families they return back to Mosul, which is uh, was home of more than 60,000 Christian in uh, 2003. So uh, uh, I I don't know what the community can do, but uh, uh, it's the challenge for the Iraqis. Uh, as all as all components of Iraq, mm -hmm. and now the the pro demonstration in Baghdad is asking the all the uh, parties uh, pro Islamic ideology to leave, and to change the constitution, to accept each others, to uh, have the right to believe or not believe, and to the base should be how the people are. Uh, like uh, accepting other and living in peace, and uh, how they are loyal to the to the society, not uh, as if they are from this nation or this uh, I, uh, religion, they have more uh, power in the, in the government and or in the society. So yes, uh, uh, we have some hope now because of the demonstration and the youth, especially, who are uh, standing in the streets in the south, especially uh, 16 years from the rule of uh, uh, the political uh, parties from uh, mostly the Shia, uh, religion. Uh, now people are standing against them and uh, against the corruption and one of the things that uh, give hope to the minorities, uh, all minorities, all the indigenous people, everyone who live in the country is uh, the rule of, of law. So if there is a rule of law, uh, the rights of everyone be protected, uh, I believe that people can return back. And uh, for the point of that, uh, not only Christian being, uh, or non-Muslim being persecuted by ISIS and uh, radical, it's true. And uh, I have uh, a lot of examples of people who were welcoming ISIS in Mosul. In the end, uh, they discover it's ISIS not bringing the peace uh, for them and uh, uh, it's not possible to live under 
the Islamic State of Daesh or ISIS. I remember one uh, case of even the disappointment of the Muslims turning to the Christian religion because they were so disappointed how ISIS yeah, was. Yeah. Uh, one uh, of the radical Muslims, the, uh, the one lady uh, who was uh, 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 daughter of an Islamic. Uh, religion leader and uh, she was very aggressive against uh, any other religion. Now she's become Christian and I told her, come on, you were persecuted us when you are Muslim and now we are Christian and you force us to, to practice Christianity. So please <laughs> stop this. But there is a, a hundred of youth, uh, they are giving up from their religion in general. So it's not only converting to Christianity, maybe it's not the solution, but uh, the, the, the important thing is to accepting others if believe or not believe because that should be the principle in the country which is uh, mixed it from different ethnicity yeah. different religion and that should be the measure of the of uh, nationality yeah. thank you uh, the, there was a mention of the clash of civilization uh, father uh, chaplin uh, mentioned it and um, I mean, I have to tell you, I don't believe in this uh, theory at all, and it has been contested so many times in social sciences, um, because the human race, uh, it has had the history of exchange between different cultures. So rather than seeing someone belonging to a certain civilization or somehow being exclusive, it's not related to the real history of humankind. And, um, but I know some uh, power structures would like it to be presented that way because it gives them certain rights that otherwise they wouldn't have. Uh, I will come to Mr. Ilatov, but uh, just very briefly, uh, maybe Ruba and both Ashur, uh, because you come from the countries where we are seeing very, very vital uprisals again against the existing religious-based and um, this very st strict power el elites. And uh, you mentioned young people. I was in the Martyr Square in uh, Beirut where I saw this human capital that were just asking for their human rights and their democracy in the country. I mean, will the youth bring any change? I think, uh, yes, it, uh, it should be. And uh, the example of that, it starts from last Christmas. Last year, there was a uh, uh, head of the uh, Shia religious directory, which is uh, uh, the powerful director representing the Shia religion, who was saying that, Islam, yeah, mm -hmm. so it was saying that uh, it's not allowed, it's not accepted to celebrate or say even happy Christmas to the Christian neighbors. Uh, uh, it's not from our culture. And uh, the reaction was from the civil societies, from people. Uh, they starting in Najaf, which is the most uh, mm -hmm. uh, holy state for the, for the Shia and Karbala. So they starting uh, installing uh, Christmas trees and uh, wearing Baba Noel <laughs> clothes. And as answer to the, the religious leaders who were asking people to not celebrate. And uh, the same happened to the Sunni uh, speaker for the, uh, uh, in, in the Republic of Iraq, his, his title is the uh, Mufti of Iraq, as uh, uh, he was uh, say, saying the same statement, but the answer was the same from the society. So they do as kind of uh, statistic or uh, asking the idea from in the social media uh, you are uh, supporting this uh, statement or you are against 70 more than 70 percent were uh, from the individual people in the society were against the statement from the religious leaders yes so i think yes it's uh, uh, also it's, i may suggest that the audience uh, should uh, check out the site uh, arab barometer which uh, gives a database the information on the public opinions of the uh, of many arab nations uh, then your opinions and uh, your views at the region will be based on data rather than uh, uh, any kind of um, uh, just opinions. Uh, Rupa, can you also um, <laughs> yes, comment on the youth involvement in the movement for uh, democracy and human rights in Lebanon?
Hello? Test? Okay. Uh, no, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I truly believe that uh, human rights uh, cannot be separated. So whatever my colleague uh, and my friend Ashur was talking about is not something that concerns only the Assyrians uh, minority. It concerns me as a human rights activist. Uh, what's happening to the Kurds, uh, it's concerning me. What happened uh, to anyone suffering from uh, Russian uh, human rights abuses, uh, it, it affects me as a human rights activist. So human rights cannot be separated, cannot be uh, divided. Uh, so, but in my opinion also, we should not fall to oversimplifying or essentializing all the world's problems uh, into religion alone. Whatever happened to class, what happened to economic injustice, uh, what happened to uh, uh, police states, what happened to uh, bad political governing, I mean, uh, uh, all of these are also causes for uh, otherwise, why are the Muslim majorities revolting? I mean, we are brave enough, we don't need any uh, uh, states telling us or dictating to us that in our countries we don't have democracy, then yes, of course, and we are brave enough to go to the streets. Uh, you know, sometimes, Hille, I go on Skype and the majority of my friends on Skype will never be online again because they were killed to defend democracy and to defend human rights. So I don't need anyone to tell me that we need democracy or my states don't have democracy. To the contrary, as a human rights activist, we are at the forefront of fighting for this democracy. Youth are in the streets every day to fight for this democracy. We are risking our lives. I will not fear not coming back to, to my country because of a simple panel. I'm putting my life at risk every day in the streets to fight for dictatorship regimes. Whenever we focus only on ISIS, for example, in the case of Syria, what people don't know is 80% of those who are losing their lives are Muslims, and 80% of them are persecuted by the Syrian government, the same government that European states themselves are trying to normalize with. The Iraqi government, I mean, the Iraqis themselves are in the street. Muslim Iraqis are telling them, we don't want you. We don't want your constitution. So I'm very careful like to try to ins always essentialize to only the minorities. We respect the minorities. We are there to fight with them side by side. And this is why I think building solidarity today in our, con in, in our regions and in the world in general, because all of our struggles at the end of the day are the same and are very much interconnected. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we only have 12 minutes left, which you know, is the case always when you start discussing Middle East. Do we have any questions in the audience? Uh, then I would give the privilege to the audience, and then again, we will come back to Mr. Uh, Robert. Can you please also say who your question is addressed to? Is this on? No? Hello? Okay. Um, my question is addressed to Robert Ilitov. Um, I have friends whose grandparents are victims of the Nakba. Um, I who are now also banished from returning to their homeland of Palestine. I have friends who have volunteered for organizations in Palestine and Gaza and seen, um, witnessed directly and have shown me evidence directly of the um, violations that the Israeli government and the IDF put to human rights of the people of Palestine. Um, I would argue that in fact you are a prime example of human rights being oppressed um, both as part of the oppression, the oppressors, and um, as somebody who stands here today repeating the propaganda of the Israeli state. Um, the, this is not about a, the religion of Judaism. Um, I respect all religions, um, but this is about Zionism and the oppression, the oppression um, committed by the likes of the IDF and the state of Israel. People who do uphold rights around the world, have the right to boycott Israeli products, and have the right to not want to sit on a panel with people who are complicit in the mass genocide of the Palestinian people. Thank how you. can you stand uh, what here? What is your question? Yeah, the question now. Um, how can you stand here today and claim that Israel up, upholds human rights tru truly in this knowledge? Okay. Uh... אני מבין שזאת הייתה הצהרה כלשהי שהיא בעצם איננה תואמת את המציאות. הרי אין חייל אחד בעזה מאז שישראל החליטה להוציא משם את ה... 
No translation. We don't understand. So I'll wait. Sorry about that. So this is now coming back to the day when in 26 uh, Israel uh, decided to leave Gaza. So this is how it uh, harks back to that period. I'll have to start again. So this is another example of what is not in correspondence with the reality because Israel has not been in Gaza since the government decided that uh, all the Israeli settlers will need to leave uh, in, uh, uh, and that was in 2006. So uh, the government in Gaza was uh, then taken over by Hamas, which is the terror organization. And they destroyed the uh, autonomy of uh, Palestine. They killed the Palestinian government. That was Sunnis against Sunnis. It was a terror organization against another terror organization. So they decided to start negotiating with Israel. They were killed by the others, but they were killed because they did not agree that Israel will have to remain on the map of the world according to their ideology because this is what they've stated publicly. They say that they want to uh, have the Israeli state eliminated and the state of Israel has a right to protect itself, a right to protect its borders. And the fact of the matter is that uh, there is an attempt to cross these borders. Uh, they've tried to dig tunnels. We've destroyed many of these terror tunnels. We've used new technologies. So all these tunnels have been created with one aim, to reach the territory of Israel, to kill the uh, citizens of Israel. There is no other aim. So we, uh, it's, it's not the question of support for us, but we need to create a situation first that they the people in Gaza would be able to handle uh, this uh, terror organization there. Because Israel has a right to defend itself. And we can defend our citizens. And uh, Jews have a right to live as well. OK, thank you. Uh, again, I will give the priority to the audience, rather. Yes, please. Uh, by the way, just uh, uh, information came in that Father, uh, Father uh, Chaplin is still online. And if anyone has a question for him, you are welcome to ask it. He's following the discussion now. Yes, please. microphone was not working. Tere, Indrek Teter. Indrek Teter. What will be the self-defense of human rights? And very specifically, that's my question. Who is your question addressed to? To everyone. Who would like to respond? The self-defense, how does that contradict with human rights? Well, the uh, rights without implementation, uh, without uh, protection, if necessary, by state force, they, they are just declarations. Um, uh, is it the self-defense or defense by something else, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, in the long run, of course, you can say that uh, if human rights are only to be defended by the force alone, they are actually not working. They are still just declarations. So maybe, again, this, these other means or forms of governance power through education, through societal, civic education, and so on, are safe safeguards uh, that might take more time, but uh, in the long run are more efficient than just 
executive okay. force. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, my question is uh, a yes and no, a yes or no question, and it's directed to everyone. As uh, uh, Ulla Madiso mentioned at the beginning of uh, her speak, that uh, it is inherent that people uh, all wish to have human rights and live dig in a dignified life, but it seems also that it is inherent that people, in or every person is also able to um, somehow uh, uh, violate other people's human rights in order to do so. So my question is this, and it's to everyone. Do you believe that every single government and every single um, uh, uh, society has the obligation to look self-critically at its own governing uh, uh, at its own governing uh, situation when, especially when they are in a state or in a situation of power. Thank you. I, yes, I guess. You believe that the governments are able to the, uh, government, reflect? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. They have an obligation to. Yeah. Is, is that yes, or no? yes, yes. The they have an obligation yeah. to. Yes, of course. Yeah, of course, I also agree, and I would even say that it's not only an obligation, it's actually in many ways useful for the development of society. Ruba. Of course, yes, but this is also the role of human rights activists, civil societies, forums like these to hold the people in power accountable. Yes, because uh, many times, especially in the region uh, we have been discussing, the powers have guns, and a lot of them. So it's not very easy to ask them to self-reflect critically. Anyone else in the audience? We still have a few minutes. So, uh, dear Robert, um, I will uh, come back to the, the essence uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. So somehow it came across to me as um, you claiming that the Muslim uh, societies have a fundamental problem with the human rights and uh, you named uh, examples of it. Uh, do you really think or, uh, or was I getting it wrong that uh, this is a generalization that is not quite correct because we have heard today of other examples of groups in many Muslim societies who are, are willing to actually die for their human rights, literally. So how do you comment on these masses on the streets in Lebanon, your neighboring states, in Iraq? Could you call Medinat Israel? You hear me? Yes. Could you call Medinat Israel? So when it comes to State of Israel, then Israel is very much interested that our neighborhood would uh, be uh, would be represented by democratic and free societies where the human rights are respected. This will be very important for Israel's point of view. Maybe the realities will change because uh, we would, of course, uh, uh, see the situation that the Arab co uh, countries, instead of uh, dealing with their own problems, they accuse Israel of uh, Palestine problems. But Palestine is a very tiny part of a Muslim world. They ought to live uh, much better than uh, any other Arabs in our neighborhood. They have everything they need. They have all the rights. Uh, they have food. They have uh, clean air. They have security. They have jobs. So this is the best you can have to happen to a neighbor, that you have a neighbor who would produce things and uh, work, and there's a right to do business, a right to engage in trade, and a right to uh, live you know, in a respected and free society. 
And of course, what I would like to say is that um, our neighborhood will be free and democratic neighborhood, and it'll be a whole lot easier for us as well. We could um, deal with them better, we could help them. Uh, if we take um, agriculture, then uh, Israel is an agricultural giant. We have great technologies, but our neighbors do not have food. We could help them, we could feed them, and uh, help them to grow food. We could uh, help you with the agriculture. And there are many Arab countries today who um, have uh, contact with Israel because they have some uh, security issues, they have uh, business interests, and we try to develop these uh, relationships, and we want to create diplomatic relations as well. Ties of friendship with everybody who wants to have ties of friendship with Israel. So you can't come and say that Israel is not good, Israel does this and that. Then. Um, I would say that, uh, first of all, you would need to sort out your own internal affairs, but do not uh, tell us what we need to do. We have a strong uh, rule of law, strong judicial system, and uh, we have uh, uh, we have presented um, uh, accusations to the Prime Minister of Israel. We have a soldier in uh, jail who shot a terrorist. Uh, so if we have very strong judicial system, and if we make mistakes concerning the human rights, then this uh, person will have to uh, pay its price. And we have independent press. We have the judicial system, which keeps everything in control. And there is a punishment at the end of the day. Uh, I'm very quickly uh, giving one extra minute to Father Sevalod if he can hear us. Because uh, I'm very sorry, I didn't know you were online with us. I uh, didn't address any questions. I will give you the final words to sum this panel up. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very grateful for the remark of the first speaker. Uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, the role of education is very important and the role of the power is very important. But uh, the main question, the main problem is, what are the hard values which uh, the activities of educators and the power uh, are based on? Uh, you know, there were many uh, uh, cases in history when uh, this society itself decided that the uh, values can be radically changed. In some societies, it was uh, allowed to kill people on the basis of the social background or an ethnic background. I would not be surprised that one day uh, the societies can decide that it's legitimate, in a way legitimate, to eat other people or to uh, legalize pedophilia. Uh, and that can be easily supported uh, by both the power and education. And that even can be put into uh, the context of uh, the question of human rights. Some people say that even uh, children have the right to have sex with the adults. Uh, I think uh, without hard values, unchangeable values, it's very, uh, it's very hard actually to uh, define uh, what the directions of the society may be. Even the education may be perverted, even the Dear power Father, I uh, hate to disturb may be perverted, you. and that happened many times. But uh, we have run out of time. Uh, these intriguing words, whatever you make from it, were the last ones of this panel. I'm very sorry about this. Please join my panel speakers during our coffee break. Don't be shy to ask any further questions. And I thank you very, very much for being with us. Thank you very much.